good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, the Australian Committee um, for the welcome that we have received once again, um, for the pleasure, the sincere pleasure and joy that I have in in working uh, with Emmanuel and with your organizations. It has been um, well over a decade that we have been working together and um, I believe we have accomplished quite a bit um, together. With the British Committee, we have accomplished quite a bit together. And what I'd like for all of us to, to keep in mind is that this is a global campaign. And it's more than any individual's opinion. It's about all of us sharing our opinions and working together toward a common goal. Respecting each other, respecting each of our disciplines, our strengths, and working together toward a common goal. With that, I normally speak of the historical aspects of the taking itself. And my presentations are usually focused on the legalities of, of said takings and the ramifications of, of these historical events and how they play out uh, you know, today in the 21st century in the development of customary law uh, and the development of what law is today, the applicable laws. I have decided to broaden that up a little bit. I, I, have, a, I have a bit of a benefit in that I've, I've given uh, over the last 20 years, uh, I, I've given so many different kinds of lectures, and, and, and some of the most enjoyable lectures I've given have been to attorneys, uh, teaching attorneys in, in, in certified legal training courses about international law and international litigation. Um, and in those instances, I'm able to speak for eight hours. So I can speak for eight hours, um, uh, ask my wife. Um, and speaking for such a long time gives me the advantage of speaking a number of different areas, um, a number of different areas of this debate. So what I'd like to do today, in taking this opportunity, considering how, how, how this is going worldwide, I, I'd like to talk about cultural property itself. And I, I'd like for us to consider um, what this means to the world. So, so my speech today, I titled it, By Protecting the Cultural Property of Greece, we are protecting the cultural property of the world. So what is cultural property? And why is it important that this property be returned to the country where it was created? I'd like you to consider the following examples. For Americans, take the Lincoln Memorial as your example. For the British, take Stonehenge. For Italians, take the Colosseum. For Egyptians, take the Pyramids. For Indians, take the Taj Mahal. For Chinese, take the Great Wall. For Israelis, take the Wailing Wall. For Australians, take the Sydney Opera House. For Greeks, take the Parthenon. For everyone else, I want you to take the most recognizable work from your country's history, something of historical significance, significance to your people that makes you all proud, something that binds you together and holds a special significance to all of you, something that truly symbolizes your past and to which you all identify as being a part of your identity. Now the object you see before you is probably cultural property. Now keep your eyes closed for a moment and picture that same item sliced into pieces, not by your consent, but rather by the overwhelming power of an invading force. I want you to pause for a minute. I want you to think about that. I want you to visualize it in pieces. I want you to visualize it being cut into pieces and ripped apart. Now, imagine that work being looted from your country at a time when your people could not stop the taking. Now take those several, those severed pieces and scatter them across the globe. Picture one in a museum in a neighboring country hundreds of miles away. Picture another in a museum thousands of miles away. Picture all the pieces you tore apart in your mind scattered across the globe. Now, 
Imagine that all the museums that display these fragments of your cultural property refuse to return them to your country. Take it one more step. And imagine now that they claim to own those pieces. Imagine further that the governments of the countries in which those museums are located support those museums' claims of ownership and the refusal to return them because they deem them the property now of the museum. I ask you, how do you feel? Now recall your piece of history when we begin. Recall it as one singular work of art. Again, I ask you, how do you feel that your people do not even own those severed pieces? Let's walk through an example. Let's take the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of freedom and hope that holds a patriotic place in the heart of every American, a towering monument that portrays a woman escaping the chains of tyranny, holding in her right hand a flaming torch which represents liberty. In her left hand, she holds a tablet with the date of our independence etched on the side, July 4th, 1776. The seven crowns on her head and her flowing robes symbolizing the seven seas and continents, an open invitation to the people of the world seeking freedom from oppression to come to our shores. The Statue of Liberty has profound meaning to Americans and it represents the spirit of our country. It embodies all the good that we aspire to be. Without question, the Statue of Liberty is our cultural property. Now imagine the head of the Statue of Liberty decapitated from her torso. Imagine the torch torn from her hand, the tablet broken into pieces. Imagine her head being owned and displayed by a foreign museum. The torch owned and displayed in another museum. The broken tablet pieces in various museums. Pause to think about this. Ask, how do you feel? And how would you expect Americans to feel? That feeling that we've been going through now, that's exactly what the struggle over looted cultural property is all about. Now, cultural property also has value. It is valued because possession, control, and ownership are all a part of this struggle. As a result, there are other parties that must be heard and considered in beyond the source country, beyond the countries of origin. I have a limited amount of time today again, so forgive me for not addressing each one of these uh, parties, but I believe that one particular party um, deserves attention and addressing, and that is the museums themselves. Museums are institutions established to enlighten and educate our society as to the aesthetic beauty and significance of artifacts and works of art. Do they not have rights? For their part, they have fostered respect and admiration for the country of origin of whose works they display. They have provided an environment whereby the significance of art and the genius of the people who created it can be viewed and appreciated. These institutions do not insult the countries of origin. They praise them as examples of mankind's greatest successes and achievements. Indeed, they respect the people's, the, the history of the people's art and artifacts that they display, otherwise they wouldn't display them. And to those international museums, even their fiercest opponents have to concede that the patrons of those institutions are exposed face to face with the history of the world in one convenient setting. Children are inspired, students are educated, and adults are awestruck. The benefits of such, such establishment cannot be casually disregarded in favor of a quick moral decision to return any of these pieces to their countries of origin. And there is also the strong economic component of this debate that form a part and parcel of their claims. 
museums and or their sponsoring governments often purchase items and spend exorbitant amounts of money on preserving and displaying them. Accordingly, emptying out all of these international museums could be seen as Robin Hood justice. Is that right? Is that fair? There are so many competing parties in this, and it's very important that we pause in considering how to resolve these disputes. Would it be that easy that I could simply say to you all, the law says that art and artifacts that have been looted have to be returned to their country of origin. But there is no single law that around the globe that says this. There are indeed a growing number of international laws, inter intergovernmental treaties mostly, that deal with this subject and call for repatriation. But these laws are enforceable, are, are never enforceable in the countries in which most of these antiquities are located. These laws calls for interested parties to voluntarily work together to discuss these issues. It's very different from a law that compels someone to do something. But there is a growing body of customary international law that many of us have been contributing to by publication of legal theories and analysis of sensational examples of historical wrongs that have allowed looted art and artifacts to remain away from their source countries. The growth of this body of law has been incredible and continues to grow as widespread acceptance as to what we in the 21st century will accept as right and wrong and what historical wrongs we demand to be righted. So, how is ownership of cultural property resolved today? Who has the right to own someone else's past? Can anyone own someone else's past? Or is cultural property something that is owned by everyone? Maybe it's something that's not even capable of being owned as we presently understand this legal concept. In short, cultural property is analogous to an Afghan interwoven with pieces of history, philosophy, morality, and law. The debate draws in a plethora of actors from archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, legal, ethical, economic professors, private art collectors, politicians, governments, and world governmental organizations, not to mention the museums holding the pieces, and the countries of origin, and the descendants of the people who demand the return of their ancestral patrimony. So the challenge in deciding who owns cultural property is very complicated because all of the players involved are seeking to establish a resolution slanted in their favor. But the reality is, is that if litigation is to be avoided, then all interested parties must understand that the reality is they are dependent upon each other and they must find a resolution to their competing rights in a fair manner one whereby they can all be winners, not just one. Now, turning now to the cause set of a of all disputed cultural property claims, let's consider the Parthenon sculptures, why we're here today. The Parthenon sculptures, also known as the Elgin Marbles, as a man reminded us, are a collection of some of the most acclaimed and symbolic sculptures that the world has ever known. For generations, the Parthenon and her sculptures have served as a paradigm of modern art and architecture. Without question, they are the cultural property of Greece. The sculptures were an integral part of the temple that adorned the walls of the Parthenon for nearly two and a half thousand years until they were forcibly removed by Helvin and his men between 1801 and 1810. The taking is the foremost example of 19th century colonial looting that has filled the trophy cases of the British Museum with treasures and spoils of war, amassed at the height, at the height of European colonialism. The taking it occurred at a time when Greece was occupied by the Ottoman Empire, as she had been for nearly four centuries prior thereto, at a time when she was without power to stop this pillage. Now, the circumstances surrounding the taking, 
the documented bribery and extortion employed by Elgin and his men to effect the dismemberment and to box and ship part of Greece's most prized piece of cultural property is what makes this debate the cause of the day. Because it is through a complete and detailed analysis of this debate and the competing ownership claims involved that a clear understanding of how cultural property should be treated can be understood. It is my hope that people around the world will realize the significance of cultural property to the people of its country of origin. It is my hope that such knowledge will inspire students, educators, authors, lawyers, and legislatures, and others in a wide variety of disciplines to demand the return of these most prized pieces of antiquity to their countries of origin. It's my hope that together we can preserve and respect the contributions of source countries as part of the achievement of mankind without depriving source countries of their ownership. Working together to achieve a mutually agreeable resolution is always the goal. Good faith efforts to achieve an amicable resolution are always the best solution. The 21st century promises to flatten the world by creating a level playing field for those artifact-rich countries that were exploited in the past when they were economically, politically, and or militarily susceptible to grave robbers, tomb raiders, and colonial opportunists. The world today is a much different place, and the time has come for historical wrongs to be righted. The future is what we make it. We either sit passively by and let others tell us what to do, what to think, or we change and we take charge of our own destinies. We either let others write our history and tell us what happened, or we write it ourselves, without fear, without regret, without an apology, and without seeking permission from anyone to do so. We do not need permission to tell the truth. And we cannot be so concerned with offending, offending anyone that we are afraid to stand up and demand that our cultural property, our history, our religion be preserved and protected. We cannot be afraid to demand, not ask politely, but demand that the Parthenon sculptures be returned to Greece. What is the future of Hellenism? if all Hellenes are so politically correct that they lack the conviction to demand a change when one is needed. There was a time when Greeks were the leaders of the world, a time when our ancestors created a light in a time of darkness. And here, thousands of years later, we remain profoundly inspired and proud of their achievements. It is a time for us to lead again. Protecting the cultural property of Greece protects the cultural property of the world because as we fight and win to reclaim our own looted history, our prized cultural property, so too will other countries who have similarly been stripped of their history follow. We need to be leaders again. I thank you all very much for listening to me. And again, thank you very much for the rest.